So this is the uh, introduction to compiling and profiling at MSI. It's a tutorial that is going to be given by me and again Angel. So, so this is our contact info. So for this tutorial, um, first of all, if you guys have any questions, just let me know. Um, you can put it in the Zoom chat, and uh, we'll we'll get to the question whenever we see those questions. And for this one, the training level is a uh, at the beginner level. Uh, again, again, oh, um, yep. Again, my name is Ham, and we have Angel here. So for this one, for this particular tutorial, the the, the recommended background is that you uh, you are comfortable with Linux and you have some basic programming experience. For example, you have done some programming in C or Python or Python and C, okay, but nothing too advanced. So. And our email address is here. If there's uh, any question, you feel free to email us, and uh, we'll try to answer your questions as soon as we can. OK. So I'm going to use, you guys can see the slide OK, right? Um, all right, so for this, OK, I'm going to put this up out of the way. So for this tutorial, again, I'll be showing the slide on one side of the screen, and on the other side of the screen, I'll be using a terminal. I'm already logged on to our cluster login node, AHL01, and I have a temp, okay, um, get that, got you in. So I have a uh, directory created just for this tutorial um, to give you demo. So I'll be working on some demo to show you how things, uh, how you can do certain things. So for the outline, this, the tutorial for this outline, the outline for this tutorial is, for, for example, I'll just tell you, uh, what are the compilers that are available at, at, at MSI, and how you do compiling and linking libraries. I'll show you how to create uh, static and dynamic libraries, and also I'll talk about the uh, GNU Make, which is a, a very uh, complicated or a, a tool to help you organize, to be better organized as a programmer as you write a lot, as you write more and more programs, how you can package a program nicely. And, and, then, and then Angel would take over, he would talk about profiling applications. Um, so, there are, so there are two parts of, to this tutorial. One is talking about the compilers, and the other is talking about the profiling, which, is, which will be given by Angel. Okay, and mixing, mixing all this would be some hands-on demo. Okay. And uh, let me see, sorry if I'm going to show myself. All right, so you guys can see the screen okay, right? So, okay, so first of all, uh, MSI has, as you as you may already know, uh, we have the Agate supercomputer. It is it is powered by 412 nodes with AMD processors, and and some of them has 128 cores per node. And we also have some uh, also have a uh, 344 CPU compute nodes with um, 512 gigabyte memory, and 100 100 of them would have two terabyte of memory, which is a lot a, a large memory node. And with that, also come the AG also comes with the uh, 264 NVIDIA A100 GPUs, which is currently the highest performing GPUs available in in our in our institute. Um, 50 of them would have four A100 GPUs connected using NVLink, which is a very high speed connection network. And then they all have a 500 gigabyte of memory. And then eight of those uh, GPU nodes have those uh, eight eight-way A100 GPUs with one TB of memory, which is uh, super powerful when it comes to doing deep learning application or whatever application you, you, you need GPU for. So this would be the top choice for you. And then we have also 10 GPU interactive nodes, uh, which would equipped with uh, eight, 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 840 GPUs, and each of those computer nodes will, will give you 512 gigabyte of memory. And then besides that, I guess we have the, uh, the Masabi. So Masabi has around 700 computer nodes, uh, run powered by uh, Intel CPU. Total core count is almost approaching 18,000. So 40 of those comes with uh, NVIDIA GPU. I think those are, um, what's that, the A, uh, actually K40 GPUs, um, if I'm not mistaken. And then 30 of, 30 of those now come with a 480 gig of uh, solid disk uh, drive. So besides Masabi, I get, and then we also have the Mangi. So this Mangi comes with uh, 164 uh, AMD ROM uh, CPU chips, and almost have 21,000 cores uh, all together. To, all of them together, 
and then some of them have two terabyte of memory. Okay, and the nice thing about Monkey is that it comes with, you can use the V100 GPU. Um, there are the four-way and the eight-way nodes uh, of V100 GPUs. Those are also the very high-performing GPUs. Okay, so I'll put one more in. Okay, this. Okay, so there are three clusters, Agit, Masabi, and Mangi. All right, so with those clusters available, sometimes you don't run a program, so, and, and there is, I'm pretty sure everybody knows um, what a compiler is. So here, just a quick overview of what uh, the compiler is, what they do. So compiler is a program that actually turns a human readable source code into a machine code program for execution. You could think that you write something in high level language, for example, C++, C++ and then the compiler actually try to turn it into something like a binary so the machine could execute your program. It's like every single step the compiler trying to do something, it tries to make your source code closer to the machine, uh, binary and eventually become binary so the machine could execute it. So not all programming languages use compilers, but the fastest one, they uh, tend to use uh, compilers to compile their code. For example, if you implement, say, uh, FFT, you might want to think about, you, you think, think about using it, using a C++ language or C to implement your FFT and compile it and run it. Okay, but I'm pretty sure, um, so in the process of compiling, most of the compiler um, try to optimize your code and uh, try to make it run more efficient. And um, there's some options that you could use to tell compiler how aggressive you want the uh, uh, compiler to help you optimize your code, okay? And so here I want to uh, tell you about interpreters versus compilers, right? So I'm sure everybody heard of, or you've heard of, Python, Perl, now these are interpreters, right? So they actually read each character and then they try to figure out what has to be done next, has to be done next. Okay, and then when a compiler actually, what a compiler, uh, I'm sorry, what an interpreter does is actually based on a very sophisticated program. Usually, uh, I, I'm sure, I think the Python is implemented in C, the interpreter itself. Um, Perl is also C. Uh, I think Julia is C and C++. So I guess underneath that interpreter, the concept of interpreter, language underneath is a underneath is a uh, compiler um, is a language that requires compiler to compile to get running so your program for interpret stays in a text file so it, it would be run as a text file and every time you run this program again and the interpreter has to reinterpret every single character as it run okay so on the other hand a compiler for example C C++ or Fortran uh, it is sometimes more, more difficult to use than interpreters because compilers come with lots of options. And also your program is actually translated into a machine language, which is then, which is run, okay, not, never interpreted. So once a program has been compiled, it may run as many times as you want without recompiling it. Okay, so you don't need to recompile every single time. You just compile, compile, compile it once and then it should, it should just work. With compiler are used by people, um, like I said, one, if you want to program run fast and efficient, then you would try, you would think, uh, pick up a language that uh, requires compiler to compile to, into a binary and run it on the machine. So uh, also, uh, compiler, most of the time, they will try to attempt optimize the code for performance. If you guys have any questions, feel free to let me know. Um, if I'm going too fast, also let me know. So here, just a very simple, a list out the four steps that a compiler would do. First of all, it just it does some pre-processing. Okay, it pre-processing it, it parses and changes your code, um, and then it tries to translate to assembly assembly language, and then from the assembly language, it would translate into machine code. And at that time, it would do, try to do some linking, linking some say header files or some libraries that your your program your your program needs uh, in order to produce a final binary. And during all this step. The com you can actually tell compiler to stop at each step and take a look at the output. Okay. So now I'm going to the compilers that are available at MSI. So first off, um, we have the Intel compilers. So uh, the standard, the standard three compilers that I always see is the C compiler, C++, and the Fortran compiler. For the Intel compiler, the C compiler is actually ICC. Uh, the C++ is ICPC. And for the Fortran is I Fort. So Intel compiler for Intel compiler usually have good optimization and integration with the Intel libraries. So if um, okay, I'm going to use a terminal here. Uh, is this font too small for you guys? Or 
Should I blow it up a little bit more? Is this okay? So, can you do once more? I'm sorry. Can you do one 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 more level higher? Yeah, that's okay. good. How about this? All right. Okay. I'm gonna. Okay. So we can look for the say we want to look for the uh, Intel compiler. Um, you do a module about Intel. So we have lots and lots of version of it. Um, the default one is this one. So if you low, so I want to use an Intel compiler. Um, you can just take Intel and, whoops. Okay, so then you can do ICC, which ICC. Okay. Oh, there's some questions here. Okay, I'm just gonna, uh, so the question is, uh, just wondering, with so much computing power, if many programs were doing I.O., would it be possible to make the disk drive unresponsive to interactive jobs? Um, huh? Oh, you did? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, thanks. <laughs> I didn't say it. Okay. Oh, okay. Awesome. Thanks. I just didn't say it. Yeah. So, Let's go back to this uh, Intel compiler. So I'll move this just a little bit over. So I you can do it. Um, so let me just do this. So let me just start over again. So I got nothing. So um, I assume that you guys are pretty familiar with the module command. So um, so right now, if I do, so I'm looking for a compiler without, I'm looking for a specific ICC Intel compiler without actually loading the module. So it was. It was tell me that there's no ICC, no, no such thing in my working environments. So when you want, all you want to do is load Intel, and then with that, it, it will tell you this is the ICC uh, compiler that's available to you for you uh, for you to use. So it also has um, so besides ICC, it like says um, it has ICPC for C++ and iForge for Fortran. Okay. So in order to use one of our comp compilers, you can you use the module system to load the compiler into your working terminal. Or your working environment. All right. So, so the next one is a very common or popular compilers. Uh, this is the GNU compiler. It comes with C compilers, C plus plus, and Fortran as usual. So it is free, open source. Um, the the C compiler is a GCC. The C plus plus is a G plus plus, and the Fortran compiler is called G Fort. So in order to use this one, so I'm going to get rid of my I'm going to clear out my environment, OK? So I always do a module purge. And sometimes I'm pretty skeptical, so I, I would do it a bunch of times. So now I want to see what GCC is available for me to select. So I can see the default one is 8.2.0, and then there is some 11.3. Uh, so I usually go with the default one. So you would want to do module low GCC. All right, so before I can do so with GCC or G++. So this is a system one, right? The version of the system one is actually, uh, I believe it's 4.8. So if I do a module low GCC, and I do it with G++, this is actually the correct version that I want. I want an 8.2.0 version of G++, and this is what I, I'll get if I load the module, uh, load the GCC module. Okay. So besides GCC, we have, we also have, the PGI compilers, right? This is the Portland group, Portland group compiler. Um, I, I rarely use this one. And the C compiler is called PGCC. And PGCPP is the C++ uh, version of it. And then this PG Fortran is the Fortran compiler, uh, the PGI com compiler. So, so I have a little uh, demos just to show PGI compiler. So let me just clear out. Um, Module purge again. I'm, I'm some sometimes, uh, you know, just want to make sure I get a clean environment. So here I have a C program. All right. So, so this is a C program. I put down some very specific PGI specific directory in my C program because when I write this program, I I want this to be compiled by a PGI compiler. So, so sometimes you, you sometimes you want to think about what compiler to use. It also depends on what program you're writing, what do you have in mind? So for this, for this program, I allocate some space. Uh, actually, this is really in C. So this, I, I initialize the array, 
And then I want to do some, you know, just summing up all the elements in the array, and then finally print out the sum. And this is the uh, ACC loop, parallel loop reduction. This is uh, Poland specific directive. So I, I put this in, in my C program. All right, so what you want, so I have not loaded. So I want to see what PGI uh, compiler are available. So we can see with the default. So the default one, so I always go with the default one. Whoops, so I always forgot typing the low. So okay, so I load the PGI compiler. So again, the PGI is PGCC, right? So for the PGCC, um, so I want to compile this program. Okay, so it tell me that it has been compiled, compiled, compilation completed with warnings. And let me see. So this, so on the, hold on one second. Okay, so, and also since, I, okay, I'm gonna do this one more time. Compile one more time with specific flag, which I was using in this program. All right, and now it's just this dash W, which is, I, would, I don't want, this compiler to tell me the warning messages. And now this comes down to personal habit, so I want to always uh, open my executable exe. You can call it whatever you want. Without this, it will just give you a standard uh, a dialog. Okay, so now this is trying to run exe. All right, so I print out the sum of this, um, of the vectors that, as, as a demo, so print out. So, so this is how I would use a PGC C, C compiler. Um, this is just for demo purposes. Um, again, um, depends on your program, what kind of program you're trying to write, and then in your mind you would try to t target toward which compiler. So, yeah, it depends. It's, I guess at the end of the day, it's application specific. The application you're trying to write and the language you pick, the, com the language that you pick to write it, write it like C. I'm using C, and then the target compiler I'm trying to use. Okay. So that's PGI Poland group compiler. Um, and now there's the Clang compilers, uh, the C Lang compiler. Uh, the, for the C compiler, it is just uh, C Clang, C L A N G. For the C, it's a C L A N G with the plus plus. And then this one has no Fortran compiler. So in order to have this one, so I'm going to get rid of my, clear my environments. Um, so I have this, so I'm, I have this little demo. Same program as the last one I was use I was using, but this one I'm trying to compile with a C C client compiler, right? So in order to do that, okay. So as usual, you will look for the compiler. Say, on our system, we only have two versions available: seven point zero point one and the five point zero point zero. Say, I'm going to load the default one. Okay. Once you load the compiler. And then you can compile your, so it would tell you coming from this directory, okay? Um, so cclank, uh, vector add, give me executable, exe, okay? And now you execute it. Yep, so this is just a print of the output, just to show you how, how this compiler works. So actually, most of the compiler is pretty easy and simple to use, but when you get down to detail, you might want to use the, the menu page or help option to compile and see what the options are available for you. Okay, so I'm gonna get, up, get out and then move on. Okay, so, and the last one is the NVIDIA also comes with its, its own package. For the C compiler, NVIDIA actually is the NVCC. Um, this, this is a typo, it's NVCC. For the C++, NVC++, and it also has a Fortran program. So this NVIDIA compiler actually is a wrapper using, underneath is the G, GNU uh, compiler itself. Okay, so some of, so you can, uh, for to loading this one, uh, to use this NVIDIA specific compiler, this is a package that you want to load, you want to have in your working environments. So, So if I do it like this, this we only have one package, one of this, which is the NVIDIA-XPC toolkit 20.11. This is the only one that we have. Unlike the GCC, we've got a bunch of versions available. Okay. 
So the next question is that where do you want to compile your code? Right, so I, you can see that I'm just doing this at the, uh, using a lock-in node. Um, but the most, I guess the most uh, productive way for you to find, uh, to have a spot to compile your program is to get a dedicated interactive session, like an inter interactive uh, real-time interactive session. Uh, so it is uh, backed by a compute node, okay? And also, if, if you compile a giant program, then you might want to consider submitting the, the com compiled job um, to our SLAM scheduler. Yeah, but most of the time, I just use an interactive session, say I ask for a couple of hours, and then work on the compiling the software. And so the reason for doing that is because sometimes I run into trouble, so it's easier for me to interact with the compile compilation process in real time, um, okay? So, so I, I think I, I've demoed some compiling commands, so here I'm gonna go through it one more time. So, so I guess these are the terms I use uh, interchangeably. Um, so I've, I always use a code, code just a file containing a computer program, and source code or source file it is a program. It's a program written in a higher level language, such as Python, C, or even assembler. Okay, so those we call the source code. <clears throat> and then there's something called object code, the output of a compiler or an assembler. Sometimes you want to compile your code not, not right away to a binary, you want to compile it in, into an object code, okay? And at the end, there's something called an executable code, which is just a binary program that is ready to run on the machine that you compile it on, okay? Oh, this is a question. Uh, let me see. Where is my... Um... Yeah. Oh, it's a different program. I print out different things. I, I print out different things. So, I mean, program structure is the same, but I print out different things to, for me to look at. So, they're not exactly the same program. So, I didn't, I didn't show you the different thing. So, this one's actually just adding this together and printing out each iteration. Oh, this has a C clan loop vectorized. Uh, Organization that provides a feature of C clank. So we're using it, so I just print it out. So this is actually different from the the, the one that the PGI one, but it's still doing the same operation, adding things. So yeah. Okay, um, here we have more questions. Okay, all right. Cool. I'm um, going to put this. Yeah, if I'm not clear on certain things, please uh, let me know. Okay, so I'll see you on this. Okay, so, all right, so I went through this. And also, here's some more uh, information about compiling commands. So usually, you always go like this compiler, the name of the compiler, the options you want to give to the compiler, and then the source files that you want to compile. So compile, the compiler name could be uh, G++ uh, or C Clang like I just used. And the flags are optional arguments um, that changes the compiling options. So most flags begin with a minus sign, like a dash. Uh, the source file are the name of the source code, like C, C++, or why not. So by default, most of the compilers, would, the output will generate a dot out. It's the executable. If you don't tell the compiler to call your execu executable certain, certain name or certain thing, it will just give it to you automatically as a dot out. Okay. So, so here, so, so in, on this slide, I show you. I'm using an Intel compiler, uh, so ICPC O, which is telling the compiler to name my executable my program, and my source code .cpp is a C++ file, and uh, likewise, you can do this with a C program and a Fortran program. Okay, to name your uh, executable a name, to give your executable, executable a name. And also, if you have more than one source file to compile, compile pretty, usually are pretty smart. They will compile them for you, and then this would be the easiest way. If you compile, this would be this would compile two programs at the same time, uh, and then you name the output as uh, my program. Okay, so. So now come to optimization, right? So I've mentioned that compiler are really nice because it's like, I know that people have been telling me there's no free lunch, but when it comes to optimization using a compiler, there is indeed some free lunch. Okay, so let me show you. So I'm, I'll be using a GCC compiler, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go back to this terminal. So I have, 
All right, so I have this program here. It's just, this is a C program. All right, very simple C program. It does a bunch of stuff, but there are two loops in it, okay? It's just, just adding stuff into it. So, so there are three arrays uh, of data type double. So it runs this many, many times. There's too many to count. So first outside loop and the inside loop runs 1024, uh, 1024 times and just adding this, uh, adding this two, add, adding two elements, adding two arrays element into putting it into the result into eight. Okay, so a super, super simple loop, right? So let's say I want to use a GCC compiler. Let me see if I, okay, so I have nothing loaded. So I want to load modulo GCC. All right, so I want to make sure that I get the GCC, which is 8.2 that I want. So this is the one, right? So if I just compile this, um, let's just let's let's just let it do a dot out. I just want to compile this, right? Right, without optimization, with no option given to the compiler, right? It gives me an a dot out as expected, right? Which is right here. Okay. So now, if I want to time this thing, right? So it should take less than a minute. Um, so without optimization. I think, I believe the default optimization that the GCC give is one of its old one, or is, um, but I could be wrong, but okay. But so, okay, it takes almost 14 seconds to run this uh, binary, a dot out. But if you, uh, you wanna do some optimization, you can tell GCC say, I wanna go with, you know, I wanna be aggressive. I wanna do the old three level optimization, right? So quickly compile, and then you time it. So without changing the code itself, the compiler does optimization for me. And the runtime almost comes down to three seconds. That's a lot of improvement. Just telling the compiler to optimize my code without doing anything. I don't have to make any changes to my code. But sometimes you are curious what type of optimization that compiler actually did to your code. So you could use an options. Uh, you can use this option, right? So uh, option is, let's see, opt uh, info. So it will tell you what actually the compiler, compiler did to your uh, program. So it says the loops interchange in the loop nest. That means it, it, it changes the, the structure of your loop. The, remember we have two, two loops in, the, in that little program? It changes the structure of the loops in order to get the optimization. Okay, so this is one of the helpful information, a helpful, helpful option that I like to use sometimes when I run optimization. The compiler is actually telling me what was done to optimize my program. Give you a very one, one line, one sentence of information and why, why it is done. Okay, so optimization is actually done by a compiler pretty useful. So there are the OCO1, OCO2, OCO3, and uh, uh, the autom automatic optimization can actually remove some unnecessary, unnecessary portions of code or reorganize your code so, so that it performs more efficiently like, like the one that we just did. So using, using optimization flags can actually sometimes slightly change the output, but actually this is a very minor. Um, okay, um, but yeah, so whenever you try to compile a program, you can think about how aggressive you want to optimize your program, okay? Now here is compiling using object files. So it is sometimes useful to compile in steps. By that I mean you don't compile quickly into a final out output, the final binary. You want to compile into the object file .o. So to do that, you use a dash c flag. So let me use this program here. Um, let me just compile this into a. So I have this one, right? I was compiling uh, example.c. So let me say, let me remove this a .o um, so I won't confuse myself. So so gcc dash c example dash c that, uh, example dot c. So this will produce an example dot o object file, right? So and then to finally produce an executable, then you would the compiler would know to use. So you give the compiler. To, so I want to name it exe and dot o. Right. So now. Now this has been compiled into an executable. So we'll compile in steps, okay? All right, okay. So there are some advantages and disadvantages when you're doing that way. Um, usually the advantages 
uh, actually outweighs the disadvantages. Because, for example, you, you are collaborating with somebody, and then someone sends you a piece of code. Uh, you can compile just his piece of code into object file, and then you don't have to recompile the whole thing. Okay, so um, it also allows linking of object files that were created via different programming languages. For example, it's between C, C++, but that, that's more, uh, sometimes get confusing. Um, but yeah, the disadvantage for doing this is that sometimes compiler might not, it's more difficult for the compiler to determine or decide how all the pieces fit together. That means you gotta be really good with giving compiler options, how, how you tell, how you control the compiler to compile all the, all the source file that you want and linking and, and putting the object file. So disadvantages and advantages. So in C, there's such thing as a preprocessor commands or in C++. Um, so sometimes you want to write a program and then, for example, you want to use a print f function. It's, that function has been already implemented. It is in the uh, header, li header library, like standard io.h. So you put this in there, in your program, okay? Uh, also, you can also define um, statement, insert constant or some, some little piece of code here and there. It will use this uh, with the pound sign. So this is just, uh, Pretty specific to C or C plus plus. Oh, um, so before I talk about linking with libraries, actually, I was going to show you guys. So I have this program. Um, let me. So I have this hello dot C right. It's a very simple program. I try to print out hello world ten times, right? Remember I said that there. Are four step that comp compiler would do. So you could actually, uh, to see, so first of all, um, the dash V option is very useful. It actually shows you everything the compiler, compiler does when, during the, when it compiles your program. So if you give this option here, it, it, it print out lots and lots of stuff. I mean, almost, almost confusing at first, but then, but then at the end, it tells you where does it pick up the library, like for some standard, send the io.h. So this is, this information um, is useful when you debug, when you try to debug your program. Okay, so if I want to compile this thing, say, uh, remember I said there's an assembly language and then, and then some other stuff that compiler would put into the, put into the program during, 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 during the compilation. So you could actually see that, um, I think it's probably the save time option. Uh, maybe what's in, what's that save temp? Save save temp. Oh, saves double dashes. So save temp. So it would generate object code and intermediate files too. So so here we can see the compiler generated dot i, dot o, and then dot s. So all these are intermediate files that compiler generated. So without giving the option, you will not be able to see them. Let's see what this look like. Right? Okay, you can just do a file. So it's a text file to compile generate. So this looks like the assembly language, right? Um, so the column, the register, and the address, what it does. So this looks like assembly language, right? So the compiler actually generates a bunch of stuff. Without, without using this option, like I said, you will not see this, but if you're curious to see the intermediate file the compiler generates, you can use this save, 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 a dash, dash, save temp to see uh, what, what, what have been generated by the compiler, okay? All right, so, yep. So now, are there any questions before I move on and talk about the libraries? So, okay, I'm just gonna keep plowing through. So, library files come in two uh, types, dynamic and static. Uh, dynamic can also be called shared library. So for the dynamic library files, they also name, they are, they are always named in .so. Uh, for the static files, they have named, they are ended in .a. So a dynamic library file or dynamic library remain distinct from the program, from your program. Um, and they are loaded during the execution of your program and whenever it is needed. And the dynamic libraries can be upgraded without recompiling the program using them, right? Because because if someone updated a library and then you, can, you, don't, you don't need to recompile a program because your program is already linked to that dynamic library. On the other hand, static libraries become part of your program. Um, usually when that happens, your program become a, a much, your binary, the size of your binary is much bigger. And 
So when when you run a static link uh, binary program, the, the library also get link into your program and also would, would be running um, alongside with your program. Okay. So the other thing about where compiler searches for files. So the compilers, you know, I I've been compiling this in this directory. Um, everything here is like I just put it here. It won't it won't go anywhere else to look for like header files or library files. But sometimes you want to tell a compiler to look for files somewhere else. So beside the, so how do we tell a compiler where to look for files, right? So um, the first thing is the compiler. Look for, first, they will look. It will look for the files in where you compile your program. And for the include files and uh, and the library files, there are some locations that the compiler will look for. And how do you tell the compiler where to look for those files? So for include files, you could tell the library to using the dash l with the name of the with the name of include, and then some environment variables that you would uh, want to use. For example, I listed a few of these environment variables that you can control to tell where the compiler to look for a specific library that you want to use. And this are uh, mostly C, C++, and Fortran specific uh, variables. And most of the default locations are actually in uh, user include for this uh, header files, for header files. So include are the header files, okay? And you could also tell a compiler the location of the file um, with, with, with the uh, dash big L. So for example, <coughs> um, within using the GCC dash big L with this path, you would tell the compiler to look for that library, that specific library right here. And you can use the environment variable um, also, which is this LD library path, or it's just library path. And some of the default locations are user lib, user lib 64, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I mean, as you work on a Unix system or trying to compile a program, you, you will start getting to know what are the standard locations uh, the compiler will look for uh, library files. Okay. So here another example uh, is so you can set you can at the terminal you can set your variable like so like export uh, the environment environment variable name and then give it the the path equal sign give it the path the colon separate uh, the other one maybe for example maybe this one already has some value stored in it you can just append it to the end and so this will make the compiler with this command export command it will look tell the compiler to look into this directory for my library. So, and then you can just compile using this option, okay? Um, so just some tips. So I think I'd show how to use a module. Uh, the module, okay, so let me, so I have this all listed. So I'm gonna clear all my environment. So let's just say, um, So this is the only one that I'm seeing, right? Which has no. But if I load a compiler, right? It actually set up the path for me already automatically uh, when I use the GCC compiler. So this is also use, useful when I try try to debug your program. If the library is missing, you try to see if it is being loaded. Okay. Um, so. So here are three programs that uh, I guess utility programs that you could use to check your binary. Uh, one is the file, which will determine the file type. Okay, say for example, I have file dot out. It is an executable 64 bit. Uh, architecture belongs to H86 64. Uh, it's dynamically linked uh, using a shared library. And then you could use, the, use you can also use uh, LDD. So LDD dot out. So it's telling me that it has a library link into the executable is available here. So this is this should be available on, on the system. Uh, I say standard, standard location. So it should be there when I do when I, when I do a dot six. All right. So it should be there. So yep. And this is just a loader that it needs to to, to have on the system. You know to load this library into when you run the program. Okay. So LED and then and list symbol tables of the object files. For example, I have an object file. Right? Let me see what will happen if I list this. So just just a few objects, uh, nothing special because the program has no uh, external function or internal function declared. Just just very very simple object being listed. So these are some utilities uh, for you to uh, troubleshoot your program. Okay. So now I want to show you how to how you can build a static and a uh, dynamic libraries. All right. So I'm going to this. So I have st let's start with statics. 
So I'm going to build a static library, right? So, so I have this program, to hello.c, a very simple program. It, it, it depends on hello first and hello second. And this is the main body calling this two. This two are being, <coughs> this implements elsewhere. So, okay, it's a very simple program. So, what, so for hello first dot c, it's very simple. It's nothing, just print first hello. Let's actually catch that out. Okay, very simple. Um, this is hello second dot c, just print out second hello. So, so first thing you would do is to, um, let me, oops. Let me get this ready so I don't. All right, so first thing you would do is you want to compile them into the object code, right? So you want gcc dash c, hello first dot c, and hello second dot c. So this command would put them in, uh, compile them into object code first. Okay. I want to make sure they're there. Yep, they are there. Hello first and hello second. Okay, and now you want to use the AI utility to create a um, to create that library and instead and insert the object file into it. So you want to give it a name. I want to say hello dot a. All right, I'll create this. And then actually it might be um, so we want this so you want to use the hello first dot o hello second dot o. All right. So this should create a library for you, a static one. Okay, so it's just creating a lib hello. So the name of the library is hello. Okay. So it is there. So now, how do we use this static library to create a static link uh, executable? So, and then you can also, so it just tell you it's a static library, it's an AR archive. So now to create a static, statically link executable, you would put down the static keyword, all right? And then telling, telling the compiler, I'm using a lib called lib hello. And then I want to execute of the exe. All right, so now I create an executable and see if it is, if I can run it. Yep, it runs okay. But you can see the size of this executable is quite large, right? And then, <clears throat> then you can use the file command to see, to take a closer look at this executable. Right, it's, a, it's a statically linked. So we just create a static library and create a binary that is statically linked to it. Um, okay, so let's say I move my library. Let's say I use the move command to move it into a directory called lib, right? Okay. So now, what will happen if I run my uh, executable? Oh, it still work. Um, okay. So let me. Um, what was I going to do? Oh yeah, you want you want to tell your compiler. Um, where to look for the library. So I was going to use this. So remember I said you could use so a static. You want to tell the compiler the name of the library is hello and it is actually in the lib directory. Okay. So now I can run it. Yep. So yeah, so if you move your library, so you can tell, so you want, when you want to tell where to find, where, tell the compiler where to find a library, you want to use some options here. So I use the name of the library and the location where it is. Okay, um, so this is how we create static library. That's a very simple demo. Uh, now I want to do a share version of it. So, so now I have prepared all this. Um, so, all right. So let's see. Okay, so there's some options I want you to, we just need to use. So to create a shared library, the first step you want to do is, as usual, create an object file. So this, that's the option that one you use. So, so dash, dash C option is just telling you, come out, I want the object file. And this dash F pick is actually, is the telecompiler to generate uh, relocatable addressing. Um, the PIC stands for position independent code. Um, so we'll do this and then we try, the first thing is to um, generate the object code. Right. Okay. 
All right, and then, so I want to use a, I want to call this the same, this, I want to use share, so the keyword to dash shared, and then I want to use those object file that I just created. All right, um, and then I want to call this hello.so. So I want to create a file, create this share library.so. All right, so, so I have my file created here, the share library, okay? And now, now, and now I want to compile, um, use the share library to compile to make it executable, right? So we could do, uh, what was the command? Let me think. Actually, I think that was, uh, yeah. So I want to produce an executable using this specific library. So the source code, right, um, and then hello.so, and then what else, what was the command? Um, the executable, yes, okay, like that. Okay, so I'm using the file I just created, right, and now you can look at the, so the ex executable is much smaller in size, and you can check, take a closer look using LDD, so why is it not found? Because, so this is one of the things that you might, you see all the time. So, I mean, I see all the time, but you might also run into. But, so in order to do that, to fix this problem, remember I talked about the uh, export command, LD library path, right? So what you want to do is tell the compiler where to look for this uh, specific library you just created. So I think it's temp to the demo create. Okay. Um, all right, so now if I do LD, next again. So it tell me the library actually is in here. So, it, so when I execute this program, right, it should run. Okay, right, okay. So that's in a nutshell how we create a static library and a dynamic library and, and run it. Uh, some simple steps, but it takes some, I guess, some time to play with it and get used to it. Are there any questions? Okay, so I'm a, if not, I'm going to go ahead and talk about building systems, right? So ultimately, this is, for example, you have a large project, and there are lots of source files that you want to compile, and then sometimes things can get messy. So what you want to do is have a good utility tool to help you organize and compile files um, that make your life easier in a way. So one of the tools to do that is the GNU make. So, but before I go into this, for example, I'll show you how this, so I download two programs. Um, one is Unit. So this is a TAR, already TAR, TAR program, TAR and GC. So let me just expand it. All right, so, okay, sometimes you, you download a program and you want to compile it. So it is just a source code, right? It's, has, it has, it is, there's no binary available. You, ha, you have to compile it. So in here, there's a make file. But before, you get, before we get to the, the true version of the make file, for this particular program, you can look into the install instructions. It tells you how you can get how you can configure the software and then compile it and then install it, okay? So the reason I'm doing this is, so this is often time what happen in your site. Um, you download a source program written either in C, C++, or Fortran, and you, you need to compile it to make it run on your system or on the system that you are using. So prefix equals, so I'm just giving a location. I'm, I'm, this is, what I'm doing here is telling this Telling this uh, configuration script to, when the binary is generated, it please install it into this directory, into this three demo typical packages directory. So I'm running the compiler. So, so we try to configure and set up a make file. So it says at the end, creating make file. 
So this is the true make file that you would, we would need to build the software. And in there, lots of lots of information and options and, and settings to how to build the software for the system. Okay, so, uh, so I want to see what, what my environment. So I, I have some GCC. Oh, good. So I have GCC already loaded. So it was configured using a GCC, I believe. I might have been using a system GCC, but let's just say I want to make it. We okay, compile it. So it does compile. So it is super quick because this is a very small program. Um, and now usually we do make install. So make install would install the software into a directory called, uh, what was this? Um, called into this bin. So I put it in here. So the utility program should be here. So it has installed this program into this specific directory. So uh, the reason for this demo is that um, I just want to show you sometimes you download source packages. They are not compiled. And you need to compile uh, on your own. So this is the, the first thing you would do is try to read the instructions, say how, how it is, how how does software recommend you to install it and compile it by reading instruction, and then, and then you can also sometimes you they have some specific requirement that like what version of GCC you're supposed to use to compile the program. Okay. Um, so are there any questions? So. So I'm going to talk about GNU Make utility. So what is GNU Make? GNU Make is just a tool to control the generation of executables and other non-source files of a program from program source files, right? So it automatically determines which part to build, and it has a make file. It always has a make file that comes with it. So whatever you want, however you want to control the compiler, you do it in the make file. Make file is just a plain text file, and it uses a date modified timestamp to know when changes are made to any files, and then compile, compiling accordingly. And if a single dependency changes, it is recompiled plus, plus all dependent sources. So it actually, so to run it, you run one command and let it, let it just do the rest of it. So what is the make file? So let me, let me go into the make. So I prepare something beforehand. Um, so I have a hello.c program here. It's also a very simple C program, just to demo how to use a make file. So a make file is a very simple text program, right? It's a very simple text file. So this is my target. And then say I want to make hello.exe. It's an executable, right? So make when make sees this, and it doesn't know how to make this hello.exe yet, yet. So you look down below the file and see there is a hint. So this is the target hello.exe. And it also depends on hello.o. But the make does not know at that point where, how to generate hello.o. So look, keep looking down. And then see there's a hello.o target right here. And then see it depends on hello.c. And then finally, there's a rule to produce this hello.o, which is using this command, gcc.c.hello.o. So essentially, look top down, and then move the action with bottom up. OK. So let's just run. So uh, let's just run this make file and see what, what happens. So sometimes I like to know which make are available. So I'm using the system make. So with dash F options, you tell make which make file it is being that you want make to use to produce your executable. So I'm using this make file. So right. So the first thing is like so when the make digest the make file, it bot top to bottom. When carry out the action, top uh, bottom to top. So we can see this one and then come with this one, right? Okay. So now it should produce an executable. Hello exe. Right. It's a very simple make uh, make file. And also, what if you have multiple sources, right? So I have a different make file this time. So this make file actually produces this. This make file tells the compiler. I put in some options here also. You could actually the make file is very very flexible. I guess it's flexible. Sometimes it can get complicated, but you can put all the options in there that you need. You truly need. You can put in there. So I also like to keep it simple. So sometimes you can tell the make file I use GCC. This is CC available. I use GCC, so I put GCC here. If you happen to use Intel you compiler, you can put ICPC. Um, but that's only after you load the uh, Intel module into your working environment, right? OK, and, and for this particular one, I want to uh, see some warning messages and some any other extra warning messages uh, that my program might 
produce or the compiler might, might tell me. So I want those just for troubleshooting purposes. So I want to produce two programs, program one and program two. For program one, it depends on a, a source code called program one dot C. And this is a rule or the action that it would, it would be taken uh, by producing first uh, using this program one dot C and then they generate the output program one and then this program two. So, so I want to produce two programs. All right, so, and then this is clean, it's a fully target. So the only action it does is try to remove the executable. Sometimes I want to do some cleanup. So let's just try to uh, run this one, all right? So let me just clear it out. So maybe it's at the bottom sometimes, tough to see. So all right, so I have source code program one and program two. All right, so it compiled two programs only, right? Okay, so I have two executable, all right? Program one and program two. All right, say, say if I make some changes to this program two dot C, right? Let's just say instead of hello from program two, I, I say hello world from program two. Um, so, okay, I'm gonna put this away. All right, so. Okay, so I make some changes in the program too, right? So I don't want to, to compile, compile the whole thing. Okay, all right. Oh, wait, okay. All right, so I mix the, so, so I want to pay attention to the timestamps. So, so this will only just compile program two for me if I want to make again. Yeah, because make automatic detect which program has been updated. It just compiled that one only. So it would not compile the rest of the, uh, the program and tell the make to compile in the make file. So which is a nice feature of make. If, you're, if you have a huge uh, collection of source files and you make some changes to just one of them, then it will just compile the one that you made changes on, not, not all of them, okay? So, and also, let's see. There's some other stuff that you could do with the make. So I'm just going to show you some example make file. So like this one, I already mentioned, you can actually put some options into the, this option will go into the compiler, compiler option. So this options, this is what I tell you to use ICC, and I want the optimization 02, and then to clean as usual, remove it. And then you can actually tell make uh, to output some messages, which is pretty helpful. Um, so we can do, so this is a target. All right, just tell make to output this messages. So if you, so for example, using this make file, make file that f. All right, so I was, that was f, that was help, All right? So it just print out, oops. So it print out the messages without doing anything because I only want this target specific output, All right? Make help dash f, the make file. Okay, sometimes you could, Sometimes make can also provide you, make your life easier by uh, giving you this. So, so sometimes you use some wildcard character that you could use. Uh, this will substitute, this will look for the target. This thing will look for the target, and this one will match the first dependency. So instead of writing out the whole complete rule, you can use this shorthand to replace those uh, complete, uh, spell those rule. So which is, sometimes it might make things a little confusing to read, but once you get used to it, this is a shorthand, which is coming in handy. Okay, um, so I think that's pretty much what I want to cover for the first hour. So are you, do you guys have any questions about what I have talked about so far, or anything that's unclear? <laughs> um, yeah, and this is just using a make. So, so here, one of the things that is, is nice to have is when I run make, so the dash J option, it actually is supposed to use all the calls that are available on the computer in order to compile to build the program. If you don't want to go without this option, you just use one call, but sometimes you can, so I'm on lock in now, and I know this one is a bunch of them, so sometimes you know, I could put a dash 24, we use 24 calls to make the compilation a lot faster. Um, but yeah, this is one of the things to save time. Um, you have a large program to compile, then you will use the options. So, let me see.
Okay, um, so I guess I'll hand, hand over the second half of the tutorial to Angel. Uh, uh, let's see. All right, so you guys have any questions, let me know. Email is the best. And, uh, All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. So yes. profiling. Um, profiling is basically something you can do to get some insight into a program that you're trying, that you're running. And if you want to identify some performance problems, it just tells you which part of the parts of the program, let's say spend the most time or use the most, make the most memory allocations, et cetera. Um, so then once you pinpoint those, those hotspots, um, you can then start to consider how, how to optimize your code to make it more performant. So we're going to take um, somewhat of a different direction now. So this is, we're going to use Python as an example, um, just because it's it, it comes with some profiling libraries already that I think are good for the demonstration. So the standard libraries in Python that are relevant for profiling, the first one is just the time library. You can do some simple runtime measurements. So how long does the entire code take? Um, it won't tell you which parts are taking how much time, but it'll tell you how much all the code takes. Um, but then there's C profiler or C profile, which is a the fast implementation of the Python profiler. Then there's a profile library, which is like C profile, um, but it's slower and it's, it's mostly meant if you want to be able to extend the profiler. Um, and then there's pstats, which is a viewer. You can view the profiling results with pstats. So, so you can save your results and then open them up later. You can aggregate results. All right, so for the example, we're going to do something very simple, which is we're just going to um, generate some random integers um, between negative 100 and 100, and we're going to try to count how many of them are greater than zero, how many are positive. So I'm using NumPy to do this, and I've defined my function is positive, which just checks, just returns true if if the argument x is greater than zero. Then I have my function count positive, which takes an array as an argument, loops through every element of the array, um, and then concat concatenates true or false to this output array. And so then I'll have an array that has true, false, true, false, etc. And true is roughly one, false is basically zero, so when I sum that, I'll get the number of positives, okay? Um, to do this, though, I, I initialize output as an, as an empty array of type unsigned 32-bit integer. Um, and then I each iteration of the loop, I concatenate to this output. And in a moment, you'll see the result of that part. Um, all right, random seed set to zero just for reducibility. Um, then I make my array of random integers, um, 300,000 random integers, then I compute um, how many of them are positive. And the result is um, roughly 149,000, which is just under half of 300,000. Okay, so timing, we can just very easily import the time library. We, we save the, the time because this is actually giving you the system time. So you save the time before you run anything. 
and then you record the system time and subtract the previous system time to get the time interval in seconds. So in this case, we get that it takes just over four seconds to calculate this. Um, but this tells us, we, this can tell us comparisons, how long one thing takes versus another, but it doesn't really tell us which parts of the code might be um, inefficient. So we'll move on to the profiler. All right, so you import C profiler. Here we instantiate the profiler. And then once we instantiate it, we have to enable it. Enabling just means now we're starting to actually keep track. Okay, then when we run this, it's keeping track of everything that's happening. Then we disable immediately after because we don't want it to keep recording. Um, Profiler.dump stats to this code profile file. This is just the, um, this outputs to a binary format that Python uses for reading profile results. And then finally, we just um, print the statistics sorted by the cumulative runtime. So then when we go to those profiling results, we see, once again, the same runtime, roughly the same runtime. But what we also see, if you look through the results, that sorted by cumulative time, this is actually dominated by our count positive function. When you look at per call, it's almost the entire run, basically the entire runtime. Everything else is relatively cheap to do. So that tells us that there's, there could be some room for improvement in this count positive function. Okay, we move on. So here I, I'm just optimizing the function. So instead of, I've, this, most likely the bottleneck is because of memory allocations. Since I'm concatenating an array every single iteration, I'm allocating a lot of memory and that takes time. So here, instead of doing the loop, I'm just using the fact that I have an array and I can do a vectorized operation. So I'm just passing the array to is positive directly. So it's just doing the comparison for every single element and then I sum over it just like before. Um, once again, I instantiate a new profiler and do the same profiling. And then very importantly, before I even care about what the results are, I need to make sure that um, the value that I generate is the same as the, the slow code, because at least the, even though the slow code is slow, it's correct. Um, so it, once I make an optimization, I need to make sure that the, that the output is the same. It doesn't matter how much faster it is if it's not the same, because then that means it's wrong. Um, that's important when you start optimizing code, and sometimes the optimized code is not as legible as the slower code. Um, but in this case, I've asserted this, and it is the same. So I dump the stats again, and I sort in the same way. And when I look at the profiling results, you see that it's significantly reduced. Okay, we reduced it by an order of magnitude. Um, and now this count positive function it still dominates the entire runtime, but it's a much lower time. And you can see that in general, there are fewer um, lines here because there are fewer functions that are being called. All right. Usually you're not gonna insert the profiling into your code in this way. So what you can do is just write your code and then you can run um, your code with the profiler. So you use this dash M option for loading a module. There are some modules that can be loaded directly in this way with dash M. C profile. And then the dash O for output. So this is the profiler results that I'm gonna be saving. And this is the script that I, that I had that I'm gonna profile. Once that runs, you can use, again, Python dash M for the pstats profiler viewer, and then you, you open up the profiler results. It's an interactive viewer, so then you can sort it in any way you want once you do that, and you can also import multiple profiler results to aggregate lots of runs. Okay, so you can use a profiler to make your code faster, but 
very importantly, always make sure that your optimized code has the same results as your old code. It's, this, is, this is extremely important. So it's av avoid doing things like premature optimization, um, where you try to make code faster, but you make it more obfuscated. Just worry about making sure that it's correct first, and then profile, and then address the, the most relevant parts, always making sure that you get the same result at the end. And also remember that when you do run a profiler, the profiler runs uh, incurs an overhead. So running the profiler will make your code slightly slower. That's something you just have to keep in mind. Um, so it doesn't always make sense to run a profiler on something that runs in milliseconds, because the runtime will probably be the same as the, the overhead. So just make sure that when you do need to do something where um, it's very close that you calibrate the profiler if, if, if that's a possibility in your case. All right, that's all for the profiling section and for the, the tutorial. If you have any questions, you can email us at any of these email addresses. So this is our general help desk. Um, this is Ham's email. This is my email.